and I'm going to welcome Rebecca. So thank you, Rebecca, for joining us. Uh, and we are here for a couple of hours, hours this morning, and I'll just hand over straight to you. Okay, thank you very much for um, the introduction. So um, I'm Rebecca Killick, and um, I'm an Associate Professor at Lancaster University. And um, my research is all in um, data that varies over time um, and detecting changes in that data that varies over time. So um, we call that change point analysis um, in the statistical world. Um, I noticed just um, yesterday though there, there was a um, NHS um, plot the docs, which was looking at statistical process control, which is very, very linked to change point analysis um, in that sense. So hopefully if, if you guys um, are looking at things like that, then um, you might be uh, very interested in, in what we're going to be do looking at today. So I'll just um, share my screen. Um, so um, the notes for today um, are on the GitHub site, but I know that um, Emma is is just going to be doing it so that you can get it directly in the R Studio cloud. So, um, Emma, are you, are you able to share just the the link for if they just want to follow along the the first part, um, and then when we get to actually doing some hands on stuff, then then you can take it from from the cloud aspect. Um, yeah, so I will share the initial link, which has got yeah. all of the notes. I'm not actually separate the notes yet. Um, but here you should be seeing okay. it. So if, if you go onto that link, you'll you'll get to um this GitHub page. And the PDF of the notes is um just here, the intro CPT workshop PDF. Um so you can download that directly just by clicking on it and then um clicking download here on, on the right hand side, just this bit over on the right here. Um, and then um, the RMD file here contains all of the R code and everything else to create the PDF of the notes. So I'm just going to be posting that onto the um, cloud area so that you can just do some copy and pasting and changing of, of the code um, so that you don't need to actually um, type all the code in um, when we're um, onto that bit later. So I'll just reshare my screen with the notes. Okay, so this is um, the same workshop that, that I gave um, last year. Um, so if you were here last year, then you can probably um, leave now because uh, it's the same as what we were doing last year. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what change points are to start with, give you a little bit of kind of high level notation of how we think about change points. And then I'm going to talk about how we actually start to fit change point models um, from a, a modeling perspective. I'm going to keep that as light touch as I can. Um, and if anybody needs any um, further details, then you can kind of go and look at um, some of the papers or we have a Journal of Statistical Software paper that um, kind of explains it at what I would call a medium level. Um, and then you can go into the research papers, which are kind of um, at the uh, kind of highest detail level of everything that's going on. Then um, we're going to talk about, well, how many changes might be in our data? We may know the or think we know the answer to that, um, but we can kind of go into, well, how would we let the data tell us how many changes there are? Um, and then I'm going to talk about some non-parametric fitting as opposed to the kind of likelihood model-based fitting that, that we've got uh, for the majority of the course. And then I'll, if time allows, and um, depending on how far we get through, I'll talk about checking assumptions. If not, all the notes are there and there's more detail in that section so that um, you, know, you should be able to follow through as, as that goes along. So let's kind of first talk about what change points are. So they're known by many different um, terminology inside different um, um, areas of uh, uh, research and, and okay. science. Um, so breakpoints is, is a common one that is in the econometric literature, if you've kind of come from an economics kind of background. Uh, segmentation comes more from the computer science background. Uh, then you've got structural breaks, that's also economics as well. Regime switching and detecting disorder, they're kind of more from an engineering type of um, background. So they're known by lots of different names, um, but essentially all of these are exactly the same thing. And the difference between um, these things, uh, uh, change point analysis and statistical process control, is literally just in, in how we're viewing the problem. So statistical process control, um, which I believe um, is more commonly used inside the NHS, um, 
is more looking at um, just a single change point scenario, typically forward looking in, in an online manner. So all of um, change point analysis is used in a, in a wide range of uh, disciplines. So you've got quality control, so a bit like um, statistical process control charts, um, they use there as well in economics and medicine, linguistics. Um, I've worked on everything from kind of looking at, from a linguistic perspective, how people um, preference um, different uh, accents, all the way through all of science literature, all the way kind of at the other end, looking at, at soil types and uh, preferences for um, like recommender systems for like your Netflix, what you might want to watch next and things like that. Um, so, there's really a wide range of applications. And the reason why there's a wide range of applications is because um, any time that we view anything uh, or take data over a period of time, kind of life is, is changing around us and the conditions that we're monitoring are changing around us. And so these can create change points within our data. So just some three kind of obvious types of change here. Now today, what I mean by a change point is that I have some data that's been observed that has an order. So I'm gonna talk about time in, in, in a lot of my examples here, but it doesn't have to be time. So it could be ordered over a genome, if you're kind of looking at genomics analysis, ordered over doses, if, if, if you're looking um, at potential you know, clinical trial data, things like that. So as long as there's an ordering to the way that the data has been observed, or there can be made an ordering, um, then, we, we can apply change point analysis, okay? So we're gonna have some ordered data, Y1 to YN, and if a change point exists at TOR, then what we're saying is that the data up to TOR, or TAU, sorry, up to TAU, and from TAU to N are different in some way from a statistical perspective. So the first part of the data could be, as it is in the first example, is normally distributed with a mean of one, We've, we've kind of got that on this part here. Then after the change point, it switches. It's still normally distributed, but now it has a mean of zero. So the mean has changed in that distribution. The variance is still the same, but the mean has changed, okay? Then this middle plot here, we have the first part of the data has a small variance. Then after the change, it has a larger variance. And then again, it goes down to a middling one and, and a larger one again. And then in this last example here, it's a change in trend. So we have a, an initial uh, slope, and then we change to a different slope. It could be, as in this example, the intercept is also changing, um, but it doesn't have to be. So these are three different types of change, and, um, and any type of change that you can think of can be put into this change point framework. Um, later on in the talk, I'm going to say where the distribution of the first tau and the, and the tau to n are different in some way, but we don't know what way that is. And that's where I'm going to be talking about non-parametric uh, changes. But for now, let's stick with kind of a model-based approach. So we're kind of thinking, okay, if we were wanting to model this data, we can kind of look at it and we can say, okay, well, for these trends, I, I want to fit a, a trend model with a changing um, intercept and slope. Um, or for the first one, I want to fit a, a, a mean model where I have a changing mean over time. Okay. So what is the goal in change point analysis? So typically we want to know, has there been a change? That's the first kind of question that we want to answer. If you're doing any kind of intervention analysis or, or things like that, you may want to posit where the change is and then say, is there, is there a difference left and right? That's, that, that's almost saying you know where the change point is. You can also do intervention analysis where you don't know where the change point is and just let the data decide for you, has there been a change? And then you can kind of say, okay, well, the change is here. We know that something happened at, you know, we had an intervention at this point. And then you can measure the lag between when the intervention was and when you actually can see a change within the data. That's another way of using change point analysis. So we want to know, has there been a change? We probably want to know, yes, if there has been, where is it? Um, we may not be interested in weather changes. We may just be interested in analyzing our data and the changes are nuisance, kind of nuisance parameters that we don't really want to make any inference on. So we can just, you know, we want to kind of take away the effect of that change so that we can actually make inference on the rest of the data. A common one for that is the pandemic. You may want to kind of take away the effect of the pandemic so that you can actually just analyze your data 
as if the pandemic hadn't, um, as if the effect of the pandemic wasn't there. Uh, and that's challenging <laughs> uh, in itself. Um, but then we can have a look at, maybe we want to see, well, what was the effect of the, of the change? So we want to look at the difference in the parameters. Maybe it's the mean value. Maybe it is the variance. Maybe it's um, uh, kind of the, the forecast intervals or something like that. Um, you may want to know if what's the probability that a change has occurred, how certain you are of that change point location, and also how many, if, if there may be more than one. What I'm not going to talk about in this talk is why has there been a change? So I'm a statistician. I'm not an expert in the data that is kind of coming to me. Uh, and so therefore, I do not feel that I'm qualified to, to look at that. Why has there been a change? So that typically is um, down to you know, domain experts who, who, own the, who own the data, who understand the data much better than I do. So at no point during today am I going to talk about why there may have been a change. I may posit some ideas because you know, I may know that the pandemic has occurred and may think that that might be, have an effect in, on, on the data, um, but um, we'll, we'll kind of see where we go from there. Okay. So just to kind of get some notation down for today, um, so this is um, our, um, our data here. I'm going to say we've got 300 data points uh, down in the bottom right. And then I'm going to have um, changes at tour one here and tour two here. And so these could be kind of any point between the beginning of our data um, and the end of our data. I'm going to use tau zero to be zero. So that's just so that I can look at, well, um, tour I plus one is going to be um, kind of my first observation of the new segment. And then I'm going to say that tau three in this example would be 300 to kind of look at the end of the data. Okay, So there would be two change points, but, but I would have three segments. So I've got the first part of the data, that's segment one, segment two in the middle, and segment three on the other side. Okay. So if I want to kind of write that down mathematically, what I can say is, is I can say that my data at some time point T, so at some point within, within my data, um, has this mean. So I'm going to start off with uh, mu1. So in this example, mu1 would be zero here, or approximately zero by the time I've estimated it. And it's only mu1 if my time T is between the start of the data and that first change point, okay? So I'm only going to be using mu1 if I'm in that first part of the data. And then similarly, I'll go mu2, but only if I'm between the first change point and the second change point. And then I can continue going down more generally so that I'm going for tor m plus one, where m is my number, sorry, my number of change points. Um, and that's if I'm between the last change point and the end of the data here, that's my m plus one. So my last change point in some ways is always the end of, of, of the data. That's just for notational convenience so that I can do some sums um, later on and, and not have to kind of worry about the end of the data. Okay. So what I'm saying is, is I'm, if, if I was in any, any one of these areas, I know how to fit a model to this, just this first part of the data. If I'm within this area here, then I can write that down. That's just going to be yt equals mu plus error. Um, um, if, if I'm kind of wanting to think of this in a stochastic sense. So yt is mu1 plus some error. And then um, I know how to deal with that. I know how to estimate that because um, I, I know if I was just given this first part of the data, I know how to fit a mean to, to that um, data. The challenge comes in, in the fact that you, you're piecing these together. So you're kind of taking one bit that I know how to deal with, another bit that I know how to deal with, and another bit that I know how to deal with from a modeling perspective, I'm just piecing them together. And that's all change points is. It's just piecing together different models in a time context. So here are some more complicated um, changes here. Um, and these are starting to get closer to um, real data. <laughs> okay, we're, we're still not at that point, but we're starting to get closer to it. And I just wonder um, if anybody is, is willing to show me they're awake this morning and um, let me know where do you think 
a change point is. You can either unmute yourself um, and, and shout it out, or, or you can put into the chat where you think a change point is, and then what you think might have changed in this data. And I'm not expecting you to get it exactly right, so please don't, don't worry about that. Is anybody going to be brave enough for me? I can't see the chat, Emma, so... Um, there's nothing in the chat. Yeah, Nobody's yeah. being brave. Um, Come on, guys. I'm going to wait here. Someone saying chart one around 250. Okay, around 250. Yep. Yeah. So we're kind of saying here around 250. We think there's been a change. Any idea what type of change that could be? Does anybody else agree with 250? Do you want to posit another location? So there are a few more guesses for chart one, so around 200 on chart one, which I guess kind of agrees. And then we've got a few guesses for chart two, so around 200 and 360. On, on two. 200 and 360, yeah. Okay, good, good. You are awake, thank you. And um, so I hope you kind of realize it's quite hard, okay? We can clearly see on this left plot here that the dynamics at the beginning and the end are different. But it's a lot harder to actually say where the change is. It's, it's not like in this previous example where it's really quite obvious, isn't it? I, I think if we asked for a child where, where were the changes in this one, they'd be able to tell us. But in this one here, it's a lot more complicated. It's a lot more subtle. We can clearly see that something is changing. I mean, in all honesty, I'm not sure it's abruptly changing in this one. Is, is there a point where I can actually say this is different from the other? And I should say, yes, there is, because I've simulated it. And if you were looking at the markdown, then you'd actually be able to see the answer um, in, because of how I actually um, uh, simulate these examples. Um, but here, that there is a change at 200. And there is a change in autocorrelation. So we can clearly see here that, that you've got more runs of the data. This is a, a positive autocorrelation on, on, on the left-hand side. And then as we go towards the right-hand side, we're getting less and less correlated. So we're getting more kind of um, choppy, less runs coming in, more randomness um, from one data point to the next. So what we've got is, is to the left of 200, there's, there's something going on. Between 200 um, and I think I did it at um, 300 on this one, um, although you can have a look in, in the markdown, um, there's something else going on. And then there's another one at 450, which is actually going down to a negative correlation. Okay. But it's it's hard. And if you didn't know that there was change, there was definitely change points in that data, you might fit, you know, oh, I'll, ju I'll just have um, a model for how the covariance changes over time. I might fit a smooth um, kind of Garch model to that to, to kind of um, estimate how, how the variability is, is varying over time here. Okay. Then on the right hand side here, again, some bits are, are more obvious than others. So if we kind of put a splice down the middle at 250, we can see that we have two peaks to the left, but we have three peaks to the right. So the frequency, or rather the, um, you know, how many oscillations we're, we're getting in a small space of time um, is, is increasing. So I've got an increasing frequency there at 250. We've got um, two to the left, three to the right. Again, it's not clear to me where that starts. So where does that increase in, in frequency start? It's, I mean, they're joined, so where is it? is it? Is it down here at the bottom? Is it kind of in the middle? Is it towards the top? Um, it's not necessarily clear exactly what specific single point might be the best point to choose there. We also have a change in variance. And the easiest way to see that is by looking at the um, peaks and the troughs. So if, if you look at the peak here uh, on the left, um, you have not very much variance. And if you look at the last peak on the right, you can see there's much more variance going on. Same if you, if you look at the troughs. It's a lot harder to see when you're in the middle of the data, uh, sorry, in the middle of the curve, um, but it's a bit easier to see in the peaks and troughs. So again, it's, it's kind of, well, what is changing? and Where is that changing? Where is that variance changing? It's, it's, it's a lot harder to be able to pinpoint. You might be able to say, okay, well, I can see that this first peak and trough is less variable than the next one. So somewhere between that um, trough, the first trough just before 100 and the second one uh, 
peak around 150, there's been a change. But being able to actually say it is time point 123 um, is, is much more difficult. Uh, and this is why we, we need um, change point models um, where we can actually pinpoint down where is the best possible location for a change from a statistical perspective. Um, it may not be exactly right because in these examples, the randomness that is occurring might shift your um, best estimate kind of a couple of points before or after where we truly have simulated um, the change. So I just, before we kind of go on into how we can actually fit these models, um, I do want to kind of talk a little bit about online and offline detection. So I mentioned statistical process control previously, that's typically what's called an online method. You're getting data in, and as you get the data in, you are um, processing it, you're updating your, inf uh, your information and saying, well, has it crossed the threshold, yes or no? Uh, in change point analysis, we also have online and offline change point analysis. Uh, online analysis does exactly the same as statistical process control. As it arrives, either as individual observations or in, or in batches, you update your information and you are saying, has there been a change um, given the new information that I have? So the goal there is in detecting the change point as quickly as possible, okay? So this is often used in, in computer networks for kind of intrusion detection and things like that. If we go into the offline world, um, we process the data all in one go. We still might use some sequential methods, and that's what I'm going to talk about um, um, as we go through today. Um, but the, the goal is different. So even if we use sequ sequential methods, the goal is accuracy of detecting where the change is. So in an online setting, we don't need to be accurate about where the change is. We just need to be fast. So we're kind of balancing um, having the fastest detection rate against um, against having too many false alarms, okay? In the offline setting, our goal is to get our change point location as accurately as possible, um, regardless in some sense of, of how long it takes us to do that. So this is typically used in um, audiology and, and genomics and all of the other applications that, that I was talking about, okay? So the main difference, as I was kind of saying, is, is um, in online detection, which is what we've got on the left here, um, we have data up until the red line, and when we get to, to um, the red line, we can say that there's a change at the black line. Whereas in offline analysis, we would have the whole data to be able to say that the change was at the black line. Okay. So today we're going to be using um, two different change point packages um, on CRAN. Um, one is change point, and that's going to be our parametric um, package here, and the other one is changepoint.np, that's the non-parametric. Um, hopefully you've managed to either install them or on your own system if, if you're using your own um, setup or you'll be using the cloud setup. Um, Emma, can I, can I just check is the, is the full sorted? Yeah, so I, I'm going to post a link. I actually tried and downloading the entire thing doesn't make a difference. So I'm just going to share your link and I'm are you happy to explain how to open that in our studio cloud or do you want me to share my screen there is also an our studio cloud link that has been sent out to people um and it's usually okay. easier just because you don't have uh, uh, I, I propose i know that that you put that into the chat and then if anybody's having issues getting access to that if you just post in the chat and um, yeah i will, I will we can kind of do a first link is okay. Um, in the chat already. Great. Um, so if you're having any issues accessing that, I'm, I'm going to be talking for just a little bit more before we do our first exercise. Um, so if you just want to kind of make sure that, that you've got that up and running so that hopefully when we hit the um, exercises in a few minutes, you'll be able to um, sort that out. Also, if you didn't, if you're wanting to use your own system um, and you didn't install changepoint and changepoint.mp, please do so now again so that you'll be ready when we get to the actual um, practical session. So I should say these are not the only packages for change point analysis. Uh, some of the common ones are struct change if you want to do changes in regression, uh, BCP if you want to be Bayesian about it, uh, CPM for online and um, we do have kind of change point dot online it's on github um, at the moment but we're still doing final changes for, for it to go on to cram and then MCPT if you want to be a little bit agnostic so MCPT, um, I'm going to be talking specifically today about when we have 
um, knowledge about what type of change might be occurring within our data. So MCPT was designed for environmental data where we may have many, many different locations, whether it's across the globe or across the site that we're looking at. And we don't have the, the time to be able to look at every single one and say, well, is this a mean or is it a trend? Is there autocorrelation in this one, yes or no? So that you, know, you don't have the time to be able to actually go through and do every single one manually. And so MCPT does an automatic method that will choose uh, between a selection of different things like um, mean, trend, uh, AR1 structure, and also um, whether there's a change, yes, yes or no. Um, so that's good for if you have lots of different data, but obviously because it's an automatic method, if you're kind of looking at any single one of those, then it may be um, that it's not actually going to um, give you exactly what you might have done if you would have done it manually. Um, but it's it's a good tool because it means that if you have, say, hundreds or thousands of data sets that you want to put through a change point analysis to see is there a change, yes or no, then this will allow you um, to have a lot of the common methodologies that we're looking at. Oh. So that's just updated. So I just changed it to 2021. So let, let's now actually go, how do we actually find these change points? Okay. So my goal today is not only to tell you how to do it from a practical perspective, but also to give you understanding of what, what the algorithms are doing in the background so that you have some intuition for um, if there's any problems or, or why they're working or not working in a certain um, example. OK, so I'm going to say that, that we have some data YT here. Uh, theta is going to be uh, my mean parameter. That's the thing that I'm interested in. And then I'm going to say that that's normally distributed. Uh, so theta T is my mean. I'm going to assume a variance of one here. So this is crucial when, when we come um, a little bit later uh, to look at the mean change examples. So these theta T, we're going to assume that they're piecewise constant, which, which is what we're saying. We've got you know, you've got a constant and then at some time point, which is the change point, it switches to another constant. So we call that piecewise constant because we're just taking constant pieces and putting them together. OK, so I'm going to start with the single change point example here, as in this graphic. So we're starting with a mean of one then we're going to a mean of zero at roughly 150 in this example. OK, so we want to be able to recover what this theta t is. So we want to be able to say that theta t when t is between 0 and 150 is 1. When it's between uh, 150 and 500, it is 0. That's what we want to be able to estimate. Okay. If we knew that the change point time was 150, we could just put that into our analysis, split it up, do, the, do our maximum likelihood estimation on the first part and the second part. And then that, that would be um, um, the, the kind of valid answer here. So this is precisely what we're going to do, but in an automatic algorithm. So we're going to take the first part of our data here between zero and 150. We're going to take what we're calling the cost of that. And in the parametric models, I'm going to be using the likelihood here. Uh, so likelihood is just um, if we are looking at um, a specific model and with a specific set of parameters, and um, then we're saying, what is the kind of likelihood that that model generated this data? Okay. So I'm going to be looking at the cost for the first part, and then I've got the cost for the second part, and I'm just adding those together to get the cost for the whole data. Okay. And so that's all I do, but I need to know where, the, where to split it to be able to do that. Okay. So I don't know where to split it. Um, so what, what I can, oh, I'm just thinking, I'm not sure this one's working today. Um, it, I think it should work on your system. Um, but it, it doesn't like my um, PDF viewer uh, for this one. So if, if you're using Adobe or something on um, Windows, then you should be fine. You should be able to press play on here. And then basically what it does is it goes through every single option. So whereas in this one, I was looking at 150, uh, instead here, what I'm doing is I'm just going to say, well, let's say the change is at one. Let's say it's a two, let's say it's a three, let's say it's a four. And then I'm just gonna estimate the means either side. So if you kind of step forward um, within this, step, I can't step through it at the moment, but if you step through this um, graphic, 
then you'll see that the means either side change. And when you get to 150, they're the best possible ones. And then they start moving away from it. So you can see that when the change is in the early uh, part of the series, it doesn't really fit the, the um, latter part after, after 150 very well. It's too high. Um, and for the first part of the data, the, the second mean is too low. And this basically will move around until you get to 150, where it will be perfect. And then it will start going the other way. Okay. As we get towards the end of the data, then the second segment will be fine. But the first segment will um, either be too high or too low, depending on which part we're in. Okay. But that's all we do. We actually just try every single potential change point location, and we're looking for the best. And so when we try every single change point location, what we're actually doing um, is, is we're then just going to fit the data. And I'm just going to do exactly what I said before. So this plot here is literally the plot of the fit for the whole data. So I'm just adding up the first part and the second part at each of these 500 locations. And this is what I get. Okay. So you can see it's quite bad at the beginning. As we said, uh, that second segment was really not very good for, for the majority of the data. As we move the change point more towards where it should be, the estimates either side of the change are going more, you know, that they're becoming better. Okay, so before change, it would be kind of too high. As we kind of move along, this one goes down, this one kind of stays more or less the same. As we go past the change point, then this one kind of comes down and this one goes back. Okay, um, and so this is how we can find the change because we can say, well, the best one is the smallest cost. Um, where if, you, if you're used to uh, likelihood calculations, we're using the negative twice log likelihood here. Um, so we're, we're looking, the best is going to be the smallest uh, that we're looking at, okay. Okay, so this is how we actually find it. We say that the best here is at 150, which was what we simulated, so that's good. Sometimes it might move a little bit to the left or to the right, depending on the size of the change. Okay. So we're saying that this is the best one, best location for a single change point here, but how do we know if that change is actually significant in any way? Because regardless of whether there is a change point in the data, there will be a minimum. Here we have a nice peaked um, uh, distribution um, of, of these different costs. So we might believe, okay, well, um, you know, we, we might believe, yes, this might be a true change point. But actually, this, this scale on, on the right-hand side, on the, sorry, on the left-hand side, on the y-axis here, that scale is, is kind of meaningless without some kind of significance threshold. Okay. So how do we know that this difference is, is large enough to say that there is actually a change point in the data? Okay. So from a practical perspective, this is really, really hard to do. And the reason why is because if we actually are looking at the data, so in this example here, I simulated from a normal distribution. So I can actually get under the assumptions of a normal distribution, the probability, um, kind of the p-value for, for this change point uh, existing. I can do that, okay? The problem is that when I come into a practical scenario, I've assumed here that I'm normally distributed, I've assumed that my variance is one. I've assumed that it's just a mean change. And so therefore, it may or may not be appropriate to um, actually make those assumptions and say that I have this specific p-value, okay? Um, the default that we've got in the change point package for doing this is the modified Bayesian information criteria. So this doesn't give you a p-value, um, you can, if you wanted to, for a single change point example, um, where you're just getting a, a, you're using what's called at most one change, then you can get a p-value coming out. But the default is the modified Bayesian information criteria. And that's because we found that that is um, uh, more robust over different numbers of change points and also different violations of the um, assumptions that, that we're looking at. So it's not, it's not foolproof. Um, if you have high order correlation and you're not assuming it, that's one clear um, setting um, when this isn't going to work. Um, but basically, if, if your assumptions are appropriate for the data that you're looking at, then the MBIC will be an appropriate criteria to use if there's a change point or not. Okay. 
So I'm going to try and give a bit of discussion around this as, as we move through the data examples so that you can kind of see, you can kind of uh, have a play with some data and have this in the back of your mind of, is all my assumptions actually valid? If they are, then you might be okay. If they're not, then you might need to think a bit more. Okay. So inside the change point package, um, there's a bunch of different functions, but the only three that you really need to um, be bothered about for today is um, cpt.mean, cpt.var, and cpt.mean.var. Okay. And these are all hopefully clearly labeled. cpt.mar, sorry, cpt.mean does mean changes, cpt.var does variance changes, and mean var does mean and variance changes. Okay. So the way the package is structured is that you would call one of these functions on your data, and then the output of that is going to be an S4 class uh, called CPT. Okay. And S4 classes are nice because um, they give you a very structured output. Every single output is exactly the same. You can run different methods on it, like plotting and getting um, cost functions and things coming out, getting change points. Um, but for some people who haven't, aren't necessarily familiar with S4 classes, um, I've written some wrapper functions so that you can actually do it in a more natural way. Okay. Okay. So the class itself, I've said it, it's an S4 class. There's different slots that are in that. And the great thing about S4, as I said, is, is that you know that every time you get one out, it has exactly the same uh, structure of the output. That's not guaranteed with uh, S3 if anybody's used to the dollar sign. Um, anybody can just modify those. So what you're getting is um, the idea behind the, the class structure is that it contains everything that you need to replicate that analysis, okay? So it contains the original data set. It contains all of the original parameters and arguments that you put in for the original call. It contains um, the version of the change point package that you used to create that output. And it also contains the date that you actually created it. And so all of those things are there so that that's the only object that you need to save from your analysis um, for future reproducibility. Okay. The way that we access information from these um, objects is by using the slot names. Okay. So whereas in an S3 class, you might have done, um, say, out, if you've labeled something out, you do out dollar and then CPTS for the change points. That's not how we do it in the S4 class. For You could, um, if you're used to that, that sort of notation, replace the dollar sign with an at sign, um, but it's not as easy to find um, what, what the names are and things like that as it, as it is for the S3. So we've created these wrapper functions. This is kind of um, bioconductor as, as recommended. This is what we do for S4 classes. So instead of doing x dollar CPTS or x at CPTS, you do CPTS as a function on the object X. Okay, so we'll kind of go through some examples there. Um, we've also got um, um, methods for that. So you can just do plot of the object directly. You can get summaries of it. And um, there's other things like segment lengths if you need that for further analysis and the number of change points as well. Okay, great. So let's actually get started and, and fit some mean changes, okay? So the cpt.mean um, function um, is going to take some data here. So this data can be just a vector, or it can be a TS object. Um, if, if, you're, if you have many, many different um, observations that, um, or series that, that you want to um, analyze, then it can also be a matrix, but you need to be a little bit careful about which dimensions you're, you're looking at that. So, but typically, most of the time, we'll be putting in a vector or some kind of time series object. OK, the default penalty is the MBIC. There are different um, options here. I will say um, AIC is something that a lot of people commonly use um, because they are looking um, they kind of come from this regression context and AIC um, is kind of king there. Um, and the problem is AIC in a change point context is not consistent estimator of the number of changes. You'll get more changes than you should do if you use the IIC. So it's there because people have asked for it, but you really shouldn't be using it. So let me just be 100% clear about that. Do not use AIC because you'll get too many change points in your data and you'll think that, that why is this not working? And that's the reason. 
So the default is MBRC, it's a default for, for a reason. It works as um, the data increases in, in length um, quite well. Uh, it also takes account for short and long um, uh, lengths of data. So it prefers to um, have uh, longer segments of data than it does shorter segments. Uh, so if you get a short segment, um, it's because it really has um, met that threshold. Um, penalty value here. So if, if you are looking for a single change point um, and you are wanting an asymptotic um, penalty value in the sense that you would like a type one error um, and you want a p-value coming out, um, then you can this you can provide the um, type one error. And also um, you can, if you want to use a manual penalty here, then you can just put in either a number or um, a character uh, string here that you want to be evaluated. Okay. And um, the method, I'm going to talk about different methods today. So AMOC is at most one change. That's what that stands for. And um, so that's if you just, just purely just want one single change point, the most um, kind of um, best one within the data. I'm going to talk about these three options here, PELT, segment neighborhood, and binary segmentation. And um, so these are all doing multiple change points and they're doing it in different ways, but I will talk about that later on. Then we've got the maximum number of change points for those um, and the test statistic. So the test statistic is what cost, what model assumptions am I making? So I'm doing cpt.mean, so I'm making an implicit assumption that I'm looking for mean changes within my data and that my variance is equal to one. Um, and so the test statistic here is either going to be a normal distribution. So I'm assuming, just as in the last example, a normal distribution with um, a, cha a changing mean and a variance of one, or the cumulative sum, which is the non-parametric um, viewpoint, which um, is equivalent to um, the normal distribution under normal data. Okay. And then the class, so this is whether you want to return the CPT object or not, it's default is true, so that you, you do get that, but if you want, um, if you don't like the class structure, then, then you can turn that off. And then the parameter estimates, again, defaulting to true. The parameter estimates are calculated post-analysis. So if, if you're not bothered about, you know, what the mean value is on either side, um, or you just want to know, is there a change point, yes or no, really fast, then you can turn that off. Um, and then you can, there is a function to estimate those parameters if you turned it off previously, and then you decide that you do want to do it later. And then minimum segment length here, this is uh, the minimum number of data points between two change points. And um, so this is an interesting one because we can start to use some of our knowledge of the data here. So for example, if, if you're working on daily data and it really doesn't make sense to have a change point less than a month long, then you can put in a minimum segment length of 30 uh, or 28 if you wanna um, be kind of February specific. So with that, um, that will clearly change um, the, the segmentation that you're getting. So just be wary. So if you have some outliers within your data whereby you, know, you might want to detect those uh, by putting change points either side of the outliers, um, which um, I should say um, works quite well in this, in this type of scenario, then extending that minimum segment length is, is gonna make it seem um, that that segment is longer than it, than it really should be. So use the minimum segment length, you know, allow it to um, bring in some of that knowledge that, that you want to put into almost like prior information and in, into your analysis, but just be wary of the consequences of, of what happens with that. So there is a there is a, a kind of a default minimum set. So for a change in mean, it's one observation because I can have one observation having a, a very different mean from the others and I can still estimate them. Okay. But we can kind of play with, play with that parameter as we, as we come through to the examples. Okay, so how do we actually use this? So I've got an important statement here. So the, so the CPT that mean function assumes that the variance of the time series or, or your data is one, okay? So if this isn't the case, then you do need to um, scale the data prior to analysis or the other option is you can use the CPT mean var function. And what we're assuming here is not only that it is equal to one, but that it is constant, okay? And it's often very, very difficult to actually say, 
Yeah, no, I'm 100% confident that the, the, the variance is not changing within, within my uh, data stream, okay? So I would always argue that we should be using the mean and variance change um, because you never know. And you can have a look at the um, estimates of the parameters after the after you've done the analysis to, to decide, well, what's driving this? Is it the mean or is it the variance changing? Okay, but I'm still gonna tell you about this uh, change in mean because um, lots of people are willing to make that assumption and don't want to have a changing variance. Okay, so I'm gonna set my seed just so that I get the same data every time. And the way that we create um, change point examples is literally just piecing them together. So I'm just gonna simulate a hundred observations here with a mean of zero and a variance of one and then and put that next to another 100 observations with a mean of five and a, a variance of one. So the C here just concatenates them together. So it puts the, the mean zero ones first, and then it puts the mean five ones afterwards. And then I'm just going to use my cpt.mean function on this vector of data M1. I've called that M1.amoc because I'm doing a, a single uh, at most one change example here. And then to get the change points, I just do cpts on that um, output data. And that's gonna give me 100, which is good because we simulated 100 observations from the first and then 100 from the second, okay? I can then also do plot. And if I do plot of that, it will not only plot the data for me. So remember the m1.amoc contains the original data because it contains everything we need to repeat the analysis. So it plots the original data but it will also plot uh, the mean, the fitted mean line, which is, is this here. And we can see that that's clear with the change of 100. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get you to have a look at some data here. So on the, um, I'm just thinking, I think I need to stop sharing that and then share my other screen again. So on the um, GitHub page here, we have this GP visits um, week um, 17, 18R data. So if we just click on that, we can do download on the right-hand side again over here. Uh, if you download that, or if you're in the cloud version, um, then you can grab that from the GitHub files um, and the load, sorry, if, you, if you're in the cloud version, then the load um, should just work with that. So we're going to look at that. Um, we're going to um, load that data in here. And then to plot it, you can, well, I use ts.plot um, because that just plots it with, it with a line as if it's a time series, but you can do plot type equals L. That gives you exactly the same thing. I mean, this, this is the data that we get here. And so I'd like you to, as a task now, I'm gonna give you um, 10 minutes. Uh, I'm just gonna say, is there a change within this data? And I want you to have a look at that. So I will see you back here uh, in 10 minutes. If you have any problems as you're, as you're getting it through, please put it in the chat or let us know. And then, and then um, I can do a one-to-one -one session with you if needed.
okay, so. How did you guys get on? What did you think? Is there a change within this data? Can I either unmute and say or pop a message in the chat? What did you find? Ah, so somebody's put in the chat, yes, but I think it's a trick question. <laughs> May or may not be. <laughs> okay, good. So, so let's have a look. Um, so if we just um, load the data, see if there's evidence of a change. And um, that was to the library. So if you just do exactly what I suggested, you load the data and then you do cpd.mean and then you do the change points on it, you will get a change point at 14. Okay, so that's observation 14. So the first 14 observations are different from 15 onwards. Okay. And the parameter estimate, so we can use the parameter S function here, that will give you the mean before and after. I've called this GP default. So I've just uh, done parameter S on GP default here. And then I get the first mean here is um, kind of around four, well, almost 5 million. And then the second mean, is, is more like um, five and a half million, okay? So let's then plot that, let's have a look here. So if we just do the plot here, we've got the first mean here is lower than the second mean here. And you may be looking at that going, oh, well, first of all, on your screen, it may look different. I've stretched mine out, so it looks less obvious. If, if, you, if you're using ours default viewer, then it's a bit more squished and it may seem a bit more obvious. Um, but looking at this, you can kind of think, okay, well, is that really a change? Do I really think that this, there's a change point there? So let's kind of look at this. So if instead, you know, if, if you recall what I said, I said um, back here, oh, all right, important, it assumes a variance of one. And that if there isn't a variance of one, we need to scale the data price from our analysis. So if we look at this um, data here, we, we've got means here that are in the millions. And if, if you're looking at this data here, the variability here around that mean certainly is, is kind of in the, in the hundreds and, um, or thousands here. So we're not really going to have a variance of one here, are we? If you look at the variance, but it's really tricky because if there are change points in the data and you just look at the variance of the whole data, then of course the mean the, the variance is going to be larger than one because you've got changes in the mean structure that you're not taking into account. If you remember, the formula for a calculation of a variance is your data point minus the mean squared appropriately scaled. So if that assumes the standard variance calculation, if you just do var on uh, inside R, it assumes that the mean is constant, okay? And so if you have a change in mean behavior, it will just take an average in the middle and then your variance calculation is out, okay? So you can't calculate a variance if there's change points in the data before you estimate the mean. So what we really need to do is we need to estimate this mean structure here, look and see is the variance equal to, to one um, across the data. If it is, then we're okay. If it's, if it's not, if it's slightly out, you know, if it's, it's obviously not going to be exactly equal to one, if it's slightly out, then, then, then you're fine, but um, you may want to rescale so it is exactly one. So that's what I'm going to do here, okay? So I'm using the scale function here, and so what the scale function does um, is, is it makes the um, variance equal to, to one here, um, and then I'm doing, I, the output of the scale function is not a vector, um, so I have to do as dot vector to, to make it a vector again afterwards. Okay, so I'm scaling my um, GP visit data, so it has a variance of one, um, and then I'm making it a vector again because the output of that function is not. Then I'm feeding that into the CPT dot mean function. Okay, so then I do CPTS. I've called this one GP dot scale, so it's different from the previous one, and then I get no change points coming out. Okay. So the only reason why we were getting change point here is because we're assuming that the variance is one, 
Okay. If, if we actually did something, um, so the default behavior for CPT.mean is it does at most one change. Okay. So at most one change, that is the best location for a single change point. But if we actually detected multiple changes, then you would find change points everywhere within this data. Because every time we're going more than, certainly more than three standard deviations away, we're, we're going to be saying that, that there's a change point. Okay, And every single one of these data points is more than three, three observation, you know, three in, in, the, in the scale away from its neighbor. So you'd find change points everywhere. Okay, So this scaling is really, really important for, for when we're identifying these changes. Now, if we, if we were to actually look for multiple changes within this data and you would see these change points everywhere, that might be an indication to you, wait a minute, what's going on here? Okay, um, But because the default is just at most one change, it may not be as obvious that, that you've done something um, incorrect at this point, or rather you haven't taken something uh, an assumption into account. So if we do that, then there's no change points within this data. And you can kind of look at it, and um, let me go back to where we don't have it listed. There's, there's some kind of large, um, or large small observations, <laughs> large differences in, in the kind of de decreasing here, and also e increasing over this side. But actually, if you ignore those two kind of observations that, that are, are more um, different from the others, that the mean looks pretty pretty constant over here. Um, you know, with the small amount of data that, that we have, we've, you know, we've only got um, just over 50 observations here. So let's now go on to how we might look at multiple change points. Okay, I'm still gonna stay within the, the mean environment here. So at this point, you know, we've got potentially multiple changes in mean within this data set here. How do we actually find those? So again, I've got a little video that I won't be able to show you because I'm on Linux and it really doesn't like um, these videos, but um, I'm assured they, they do work on um, Windows. And so now, instead of looking at um, just one change point and in 100 observations, we would have 99 locations where the change point could be. Instead of that, we're looking for multiple change points and we don't know where they are and we don't know how many there are. So in all um, in this data, we have 4,851 options for, um, I think that goes up to three change points um, for this one. So again, I've, the, the video kind of shows you that, that as you kind of go through time, how these different numbers of change points can come into play. But I'll give you an idea about what the challenge is here. Okay. So we don't know how many change points there are, and we don't know where they are. And so for data length n, that is two to the n minus one possible solutions. So that is really challenging as n increases to do this exhaustive search, which is kind of what, what I'm depicting here is going on, okay? So if you know the number of change points, you still have n minus one choose m solutions, which is still huge. So if you know that n equals 10 in data of length 1,000, that is still 2.6 times 10 to the 20, 23 solutions to check. So even if you know the number of change points, um, it's really, really hard to actually find the, the optimal. So when we just had one change point, it's quite easy. You can just go through and just test every single location. But when we have multiple change points, we, we can't do that because we simply don't have enough time. So I've already mentioned this at most one change. So that's, um, um, that's what we've kind of been discussing already. When we move on to multiple change points, we have three different options that we can look at. So we've got um, binary segmentation here, and that is approximate solution, but computationally it's fast. So it's order n log n uh, in computational time. And what binary segmentation does is, is it basically splits the data. I'll show you, um, I think, on the next, on the next slide. No. So binary segmentation um, uses the at most one change method, checks every single potential location, finds the best. Okay. Once it's found the best, it splits the data at that time point and looks only before and only after. And it does at most one change again on before and on after that first change. And then it keeps finding change points and keeps splitting the data until um, either it reaches the maximum number of change points that you've asked it to, um, or there's a criteria that, that's been met. 
Okay. So that's um, approximate solution to the problem, because if you find a change point and it's in the wrong place, then that affects all of the locations of the change points that are found after it, okay? And there's also known issues whereby if you have kind of like what we call an up, down, up, so basically you've got a high, it goes low, and then it goes back high again to, to roughly the same level, binary segmentation can only find one change point at a time. So it won't be able to find those two change points and any single change point that it tries to put in will be worse than having no change point in a lot of the scenarios. There are some conditions when that actually happens. So it's an approximate solution. It might not be able to find change points that you think should be there. Um, but in general, it's fast. And in a lot of situations, it works quite well. But if you want an exact solution, and by exact, I mean it solves that optimization problem of finding um, the um, best set of change points, uh, given the model assumptions that you've made, um, then there are two. There's a slower but exact method, which is a segment neighborhood. Uh, and then there's a fast and exact method, which is PELT. Okay. So the fast and exact, that's going to be at worst order n squared, but for the majority of the time, um, it's going to be closer to order n um, in the uh, computational time. And that one works by setting the penalty, um, and then it, it basically goes from the start of the data to the end of the data, and it's always just bookkeeping where the last change point was. Okay, and so there's, um, there's conditions that allow that to um, be able to solve that fast. Okay, segment neighborhoods is slightly different. Um, it looks for the best single change point, and then looks for the best two and then uses that to look for the best three, and then uses that to look for the best four, okay? So if you want to spe specifically specify a specific number of change points, um, then that would be segment neighborhood, and that is order Q n squared, where Q is the number of change points that you tell it uh, to look for, okay? So, you know, if you have smaller data, then the slower one you might prefer because you might want to be able to say, actually, I want to look at four change points for this data. Okay. Um, the faster one, you, there may not be a four change point solution as the best solution. You may have to choose three or five. Um, there may not be a four. Okay. So let's kind of look at these multiple change point um, scenarios whilst also exploring the uh, cpt.var function. So again, the majority of the arguments that we see here are exactly the same as what we had for the CPT mean function. And that's kind of by design. Um, we're trying to breed familiarity across, across the different functions. And a lot of the um, arguments are the same, okay? So there's, there's um, a couple here that are different. Um, one is no.mean. So um, if you know your mean, you know, if you're working, for example, on difference data, then your mean should be so it should be zero. So you can say, I know what the mean is, and then we won't estimate it and we won't count it as an estimated parameter um, when, when we're deciding on our penalties. Okay. If you set that to true, then you need to provide um, the mean if it's a known mean. Uh, if it's NA, then as, as is the default, then we will estimate um, the mean and count it as an estimated parameter. And we had test.stat before. And um, if you remember, this is our test statistic. It's kind of the modeling assumptions that we're making. So again, we have a normal distribution, um, which we had previously. But now the normal distribution is assuming that um, the mean is constant and it's just the variance that is changing. Okay. It doesn't have to be zero, the mean. Uh, it just has to be constant because you can estimate the mean without knowing um, what the variance is, whereas you, you can't do it the other, the other way around uh, in the cpt.mean function. And then the other option is CSS, which is cumulative sum of those squares, which is just like QSUM, um, except it's a, a variance, uh, a cumulative sum for the variance. Okay. And the min seg len is, is the same. Um, it, it's um, the same type of premise as it was before, but now the default value is two. And the default value is two because we need two observations to, to estimate a variance because a variance of a single observation is um, it's just not defined. Okay, good. So most of this is the same as what it was before. So hopefully we're kind of breeding some familiarity. So let's see how we can use it in, in, in detecting multiple change points. So again, I'm going to set my seed. 
I'm going to generate some data here. I'm generating these all with a with a mean of zero, but you can change that to any value and it won't change um, the, the ongoing analysis. Um, and again, I'm just piecing together different um, distributions. So here I've got a variance of one. I'm piecing that together with a variance of two. That's going to be a small change. And then piecing that together with, sorry, I've said variance. These are not variances. These are standard deviations. And this is something that we need to remember. So when you're doing our norm, this is a standard deviation of one, a standard deviation of two, a standard deviation of 10, and then a standard deviation of nine. OK, so going from one to two is, is a very small change. Going from two to 10 is a large change. And then 10 down to nine is another small change. So I'm doing this so that you can kind of see a bit more um, variability in, in the solutions that we're getting. OK, so I then use cpt.var. So I should be expecting one, two, three change points from this data. OK, so I'm doing cpt.var. I'm going to do multiple change points. So I need to change the method. So the default method is at most one change. So um, at the moment, um, and so that means if I want to use a multiple change point um, setting then I need to pick one, I'm gonna pick pelt. Uh, now I'm gonna do a, a manual penalty just so that you can see an example of doing that. And then you can, um, um, you know, you, you just have an example of doing that going forwards. So penalty of manual. So here I can either provide a number or I can buy, provide some text to be evaluated. So I've got a text string here, which is two times log n. This is actually exactly the same penalty as the um, SIC or BIC, uh, Bayesian or Schwartz information criteria. Um, so I'm just, you know, you can compare it with setting penalty as SIC or BIC. And um, so that's the same parameter going on here. Okay. Then again, I'm going to do CPTS to get my change points and param.s to get my parameter estimates. So my change points are here, 100 and 200, well, 102 and 200. So you can see that 102, well, I'm expecting a change at 100, but this is a small change that we've got here. And when you're thinking about variance changes, if you think about the overlap between a distribution with mean zero with a, a variance of, uh, sorry, a standard deviation of one, and the standard deviation of two, there's heavy overlap here. So getting that change point exactly is a lot more difficult in the variance scenarios and, and other um, second order structures because it's all happening in the tails, okay? The, main, the majority of the distribution hasn't, hasn't switched. So you need to see observations in the tails to be able to say, is the distribution different? And then looking at the variances, we've estimated it at, at 0.8, for that first bit, um, then 3.69. So recall this is um, two squared is four. So this is um, going to be looking at that. And then 92.3 instead of the um, 100. Oh, but we don't have the third change point. We've only got a change point at 102, which is estimating this one here, and 200. We should have a change point at 300 but it's too small for us to identify it in this scenario. So this is why um, the variance estimate that we've got here is, is kind of in some way um, between the variance of 100 in this one and the variance of 81 in this one. So you've got a, a variance in between, okay? But that variance is, is not large enough for us to be able to see it. And I'll show you that in, in the um, next slide when we plot it. And then as long, alongside printing out the variance, it also prints out the mean that was estimated, uh, which is 0.19. So even though I simulated a mean of zero, it was slightly um, higher than that when I um, simulated the observations. So if we look here, we can see, so at time point 300 here, we did simulate a change in variance. And you can almost see that, that to the right of, of um, you know, between 300 and 400, the slightly less extreme observations. So here on between 200 and 300, you do have some larger observations and um, both positive and negative, but after 300, you, you don't really have as many. So you can see that there is a change in variance there. It's just not large enough to get over that threshold to say that there's, a, that there's another change point, okay? I'm just taking um, the ratios here of the true variances. So here, the ratio of the variance between um, this variance of one and this variance of four here, the ratio there is four, okay? So you're just taking four divided by one, it's four. And then between the next one, so I'm, I'm looking at um, a variance of 100 here versus a variance of four here, 
So that ratio is 25, so that's a really obvious change. But then the ratio of going from a variance of 100 to a variance of 81 is just 0.81, okay? Now, the, this ratio here tells me the difficulty of the problem. So even though between um, the first and the second segment, there was, you know, the standard deviation difference was, was the same, going from one to two um, and from um, 10 to nine, that, that doesn't equate, because we're looking at the square, which is the variance, it doesn't equate to the same difficulty of problem. And so the scale of variances that you're looking at is really, really important here. And so general rule of thumb is that a ratio of the, of the variances larger than three will be detectable 80% of the time, um, provided you've got enough data either side, well, dependent on enough data either side. In this scenario here where you've got 100 either side, and um, a variance of three will give you 80% power to be able to detect that change, okay? So when we're looking at this 0.81 here, that's way below three, okay? And so the majority of the time, we will not have the power to be able to detect that change, okay? And that's just really important to, to keep in mind when we're looking at real data saying, well, actually, have I got enough observations either side? Is the change large enough for me to actually be able to detect it? And so I'm plotting here and um, just using plot again. Uh, I called it v1.man on the, on the previous page here when I did the cpt.var. And then I'm just showing you some options that you've got here for the plotting. So it, by default, it knows that um, for a variance change, I just want to plot vertical lines. So if you remember the v, for the mean change, we, we plotted horizontal lines, but it did it automatically. It knows it's a variance change that we that we've used, and so it will plot vertical lines for where the, the variance changes are. And then the CPT dot width um, parameter uh, argument here um, just allows me to specify the width of of these vertical lines easily. Okay. So that's kind of looking at the uh, change in variance. Okay. Uh, I'm going to move on and, and do the mean var, and then allow you to um, have a task for both of those. Okay, so mean var is basically very much the premise that, that we've already looked at. Our test statistic now, you've got more choices. Okay, so you can have a normal distribution with a mean and variance change, a gamma, an exponential, or a Poisson. Okay, so these exponential and Poisson in particular, um, well, and, and the gamma as well, you can't have just a mean change or just a variance change in these distributions. Okay, so this is why um, they only appear in the mean var um, section. Okay, so then we also have the shape parameter here. So this is the assumed shape parameter for the gamma distribution. Uh, we can't uh, estimate both parameters for the gamma distribution. And so we have to choose one of them. And, and so we choose not to estimate the shape parameter and just estimate um, the scale parameter. And both parameters go into the mean and the variance. So it's just kind of setting one of those. And then the minimum segment length again is, is also two because we're estimating the mean and, and the variance. Um, so we need at least two observations for that. Okay. Everything else is exactly the same as, as we've had in the previous ones. So let's kind of look at this for an exponential distribution. Okay, so I'm gonna set my seed again, just so it's reproducible for you guys. And then I'm just doing exactly the same, except now instead of our norm, I'm using Rx for the exponential. I'm just gonna change the rate parameter here. So I've got a rate of one to a rate of five, to a rate of two, to a rate of seven in this example, okay? So when I do my CPT mean bar, I need to remember to change my test statistic here to exponential. Um, I mean, if you want to, when, when we're kind of having a play, you can play around and see, well, what happens if you don't include that? Um, you're obviously clearly making the incorrect um, distributional assumption, but how does that actually affect where the change points are? So this time I'm gonna use my method as binseg, so binary segmentation. And for that, I need to set the maximum number of change points it's going to look for, okay? And so here I'm setting it as 10. Um, so I have what's one, two, three within this data. So the default here is five, and clearly that may be an inappropriate default for, for many applications. Um, and then here I'm going to use, gonna change the default penalty from the MBIC to the SIC, just to show you a different example. Okay. Again, I can use CPTS to get my change points from this output. Oh, I've just realized that's called mv1.pelton. It's not pelt, it's been sick. Oh, well. Um, 
And so this gives me my 50, 100, 150. So that's exactly right. 50, 100, 150. So it's pretty bang on. And then I'm doing the parameter estimates here. And then I've got around one, uh, around five, around two, and around seven, which is what I estimated. Okay. I should say that the accuracy of these um, rate parameters all obviously depends on the length of the segment that you're looking at and the um, efficiency of the maximum likelihood estimate, because that's what it's using uh, to estimate these. Okay. There's no change points or anything going on there. It's literally just taking that portion of the data from one to 50 and estimating uh, the rate parameter in the standard way. So if we plot that, um, we can kind of just do, again, the plot here. Um, it knows that we're doing a mean and variance. So it says, okay, well, you've got mean components in here. So let me just plot the, the mean uh, values because the vertical lines can sometimes be a bit distracting um, in a plot. Again, I can use a cpt.width. Um, previously, that controlled the width of the vertical lines. Uh, now it controls the, the width of the uh, horizontal lines. And now I'm going to change the color. So I can do cpt.col to change the color of my change point lines. And I'm just going to put that as blue for this example. Again, just to show you some of the different options that are available. Okay. So now we're going to look at the um, human chromosome data. So this is um, a long data set here where clearly there's some dynamics going on. Um, we're working with much larger data here. This is um, almost 25,000 uh, data points. Um, you'll be able to see how fast the algorithm runs. Uh, it really doesn't take very long. Um, this is from human chromosome one um, and the data is from the NCBI. There are three kilobit windows. Uh, from 10 megabytes to 33 megabytes. Um, that's where the data is from. The data is contained in the change point package, so you don't need to download anything extra. Uh, it's just data HC1 to get access to it. And then again, I'm just using TS and um, to be able to plot um, the data with a line here. Okay. So I'm asking you to use the cpt.meanVAR function to identify multiple change points um, within the different regions here. And I'll be intrigued to see what you find. So again, I'm, I'm going to give you um, 10 minutes to have a play around. So we'll meet back at 10 past 11. Um, and if you have any problems, again, just um, pop something in the chat um, and then I can message you privately and we can sort it out. Okay, I'll see you in 10 minutes. Sorry, Rebecca, there's been a question about if there are any scheduled breaks. So I don't know if we could... Uh, okay. any breaks or if these are the breaks kind of things yes sorry 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 emma um the, the idea is that you know yeah use use these times for breaks as as well as the task so um 10 minutes should be more th more than enough to to kind of do the task and also have a break um but it depends how much playing around you want to do um yeah thank you sorry, i should have made that clear no worries Again, I'm going to be asking you to um, feedback what you find later on. So um, note down the number of change points that you identify.
Okay, so let's come back together and think about um, how we might analyze this data. So what did people find? How many change points did, did you get? Can I just pop it in the chat? Either one or loads. <laughs> one or loads, oh, define loads. <laughs> Um, I'm just kind of looking at my script. Like, uh, um, what did I get? Um, 290, I think. I don't know if that's right. 290? I mean, if, you, if you've done the analysis and that's what comes out, then let's have a look and think about that. Okay. So we've got, we're talking like almost 25,000 data points here. So you might think that 200 and something is, is a lot. And, and if you were giving me data of length 300, then yes, I would say 200 and something is probably too many change points. Um, but again, it depends on, on the data that you're looking at. So in this data, uh, what we actually did in the original paper for this um, was that we did, uh, we just did CPT mean bar. Um, we did it on the HC1 data that we'd already kind of loaded into our space up here. We use the PELT methodology with a manual penalty of value 14. And you might say, why 14? And in all honesty, <laughs> it's, it, it's one of those um, situations where that, that in liaising with people who understand this data, that was the value that, that we kind of came up with. And if we look at the number of change points that that gives us using this NCPTS, the number of change points function, that gives us 805 much more than that 200 that you were just saying then. And so why, why is that large number of change points kind of suitable for this type of data? Well, we're looking at huge data here where we're talking, like I said, almost 25,000. If you think 800 observations, that's still quite, sorry, 800 change points, that's still quite a large number of observations within each section. And if you actually zoom in, so if, you, if when you do this plot, um, you can just use the standard... Um, restriction for the x-axis, you can do x lim equals, and then just pick a smaller range of the data, you'll actually see that it's not too bad of, of a fit, okay? And um, so when we're looking at large data sets like this, you can kind of look at this and go, whoa, that's loads of change points looking here. But there's loads of data here as well. As with all of these sorts of um, scenarios, sometimes it's better just to kind of zoom in on a little bit of the data and, and just see, does it look reasonable on, along this part here? you'll see there's quite a large number of change points kind of that look almost to be pinning some of these outline, what you might think of as outlier observations. So there's some that kind of look away from the bulk of the data, but those are typically often not single observations. They are like 10 or 15 observations. And so that's why it's coming out as um, different, uh, having a different mean here, because there are actually quite a number of observations within that section. Um, okay, and then this kind of just is, is reminding you that you can use the, the standard um, um, plot arguments in this, like changing the, the axes, changing the, the limits and things um, on the axis if you want to zoom into little bits. Um, but yeah, this is a kind of a reminder that we don't just want to be using the, the default um, penalties if we have a domain expert that kind of, by all means use default penalties to start with, but then you need to have a conversation with the domain expert because if the assumptions are violated, then you may want to be um, varying the penalty away from those defaults. I'll, I'll, hopefully I'll have a bit more time to talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so let's move on. So how do we actually decide the number of change points here? Okay. Does 805 appear reasonable? at this point. So you might be saying, okay, well, if I'm in the situation where I have some real data, I don't know if my assumptions are violated and I want to just kind of check what I should be doing, what, what should I do, okay? And so we've got um, a function here called crops, okay? Crops is change points for a range of penalties, okay? And this function is an, a penalty option here. So you can do penalty equals crops. Um, all you need to do is give it a minimum penalty value and a maximum penalty value, and it will give you all of the segmentations in between, but in a computationally efficient way. 
So it means you need to run the algorithm more than once. So you would, you would run it once if you picked one specific penalty value. It runs it more than once, but it, it tells you um, how many, well, first of all, it initially tells you the maximum number that it would have to run it for. And then it kind of gives you a printout as, as it's going through those uh, different penalty, different runs of the algorithm. Okay. Um, and so when we're kind of looking at, at this, what I'm basically saying is, I want all of the segmentations between a penalty of five and a penalty of 500. Now, just as a reminder, a larger penalty means you're less likely to have a change point. So a penalty at 500 may mean that there's no change points at all, or it's going to be a small number of change points. And a penalty at five, you know, the closer I go to zero, zero change points is, is in, uh, sorry, zero penalty is in essence saying that I don't have any restriction on the number of parameters in my model. And so by the likelihood method, if, if you're kind of understanding from a model building point of view, the more parameters you put into your model, the better the fit will be, okay? And the, the reason why you have these penalties is, is because we're trying to kind of get some parsimony with it within our understanding and not put in too many parameters. And the same is true in change point analysis. So if you think every single additional change point you're putting in, you're putting in more and more um, parameters into your modeling, and at the maximum, which is a penalty of zero, you will get a change point at every single observation. If you're just looking at the mean, if you're looking at a minimum segment length of two, then you're going to get a change point roughly every two observations. Occasionally, it might stretch to three. Um, but it's going to be the maximum number of change points that you can put in, in your data set. Okay. So the smaller the penalty value we go, the more change points we've got, the larger we go, potentially up to infinity, the fewer change points we've got, okay? So a penalty of 500 may or may not give us zero change points, but let's have a look, okay? So to look at all of the change points that we get out, we use the cpts.full. So previously it was cpts to get the change points. Now it's cpts.full to get a matrix of all of the potential change point locations. So the top one here, this is um, our number of change points for um, a penalty of five, okay? So that's the most number of change points we can get. And the one down the bottom here is the number of change points for, for a penalty of 500, which in this scenario is zero change points, okay? And then these in between are all of the different options that you've got in between. So if there's one change point, two change points, three change points, four change points, five change points, notice how there's no six change point solution, okay? You either have five, or you have seven. There's no optimal six. Okay. Uh, and then um, these, these are kind of all of the options that you have. If you want to know for a specific penalty value, um, then you can kind of look at this. So you've got pen.value.full. So previously it was pen.value if you wanted to get the penalty value um, as a numeric value. Uh, pen.value.full will give you the full penalty range. So that first segmentation um, that we're looking at here, so this one, for, um, this eight change point scenario at the top, that's valid between a penalty of five and 5.43136, okay? The next one is valid between this 5.4 and 6.1, then the next one between 6.1 and 6.2, etc. And as soon as you go over 474, there's no change points whatsoever, okay? So you can see this is a huge range here between 6.3 and 474, you have one change point, okay? Now, if I want to look at some of these change point segmentations, I can just use the usual plot function, but now have a number of change points arguments. So this only works if you're using crops or binary segmentation, okay? It doesn't work on a standard um, um, analysis because we don't have and um, this, this option here with this um, pen.value.full and change points dot full. Okay. So if you want five change points, you've got n change points equals five, and then it will give you the plot here of a five change point solution. So you want one, two, three, four, five here. Okay. And then that might help you decide if that is a more reasonable segmentation than some of the other change point segmentations if you want. The other thing that we can do here is we can do a diagnostic plot. 
So um, you can do plot of the, the same object. I'm not doing anything different here. And then just setting the flag diagnostic equals true. Again, this only works for a crop store or a binary segmentation where we've got multiple different um, um, segmentations being produced. And so what this does is it plots the, the difference in the test statistic from one value to the next against the number of change points that we've got. Okay. So when we have our eight change point solution, um, the difference um, between the, the eight change point and the, and the seven change point solution is really tiny. You know, it's really close to zero. But then you can see that, that the difference is as we get down to a smaller number of change points. So between two and one is um, um, kind of around 70, 60, 70, sort of, um, just over 50. Um, and then between one and zero is all the way up at um, 400 and odd. Okay. So what this tells me is that when I go from no change points to one change point, I have a huge decrease in, in my cost. Okay. And a huge decrease in the cost tells me that that single change point gives me a huge benefit to my segmentation. Okay. When I go from one change point to two change points, that's much smaller. And from two change points onwards, it's, it's negligible. Okay. So that helps me decide that maybe having one change point or two change points might be the best um, from a kind of um, fit point of view. And this is really, really helpful because this sort of diagnostic works regardless of whether my underlying model assumptions are, are true. Okay. Um, it means that if I if I'm not looking at the um, you know, if I don't know what penalty to choose because I know I'm violating some of my assumptions, but I don't know how to actually fix that. So for example, um, if I am um, wanting to fit a very simple model to my data because I don't want to take into account a bunch of different things that maybe I don't have data for to be able to actually um, put regresses in or something like that, then you know, I, I have no way of taking into account that, that structure that I'm seeing, but I still want to be able to find where the change point is because there's a really obvious, maybe there's an obvious mean change or there's some other changes going on within the data that might help me make inference on my data set. Um, but I physically cannot model or cannot provide the correct model underneath, then you can use this diagnostic to help you decide on the number of change points, because this is agnostic to what penalty you're choosing or, or other things like that. Okay. Um, right. So let's maybe think about that um, using that type of diagnostic in, in our next um, set that we're doing. So now I'm moving away from using the change point package I'm now going to use the changepoint.np package, okay? And that provides one function, cpt.np for non-parametric. Um, we have exactly the same type of structures to the function as we've had before, but now we've got um, a test.stat which has empirical distribution. So there's just one option here at the moment. Um, and what this does is it uses the empirical distribution function of a segment of data and looks at the likelihood under that empirical distribution uh, you um, and then um, checks to see if that likelihood, you know, if the empirical distribution within one segment and another segment are sufficiently different to have a change point. Uh, the minimum segment length here is one. Um, obviously, that is can, can be challenging um, depending on, on what you're looking at. And then the number of quantiles here. So this is a key one to decide on what the change points are targeting here. So when you're calculating an empirical distribution function, it obviously depends on the length of the data. So if you only have one data point, I, I can do nothing more than have um, my um, kind of 0 0.5 values. If, if I'm looking at two data points, then I'm, I'm going to struggle to look at, at um, fine grain quantiles within that. Uh, same as, as you kind of go further up. So any quantiles tells us the number of quantiles to use. Now we don't distribute those quantiles evenly across the space. And that's for, for what I was kind of talking about earlier in the sense that the majority of the time, um, if you're looking for um, changes within distributions, often you're going to see them more in the tails. So if you choose n quantiles equals one, that's gonna give you the, the median, the 0.5 value, okay? 
If you choose n quantiles more than that, we start to distribute them either side of that 0.5 value, um, but varying distances. So for example, um, n quantiles equals 10, you will get um, the 0.5, you'll get the 0.25 and the 0.75, and then you'll get lots more um, around the tails of, of those distributions. Okay, so depending on um, the, the quantiles there, if you're interested in what those quantiles are going to be chosen as, um, you'll have to look at the original paper um, for that. So you choose the number of quantiles to use. Um, as I said, if you choose n quantiles equals one, you're looking at a change in the median of the distribution. And then um, I'm going to set something up a little bit more complicated here because we're looking at non-parametric data. Let me try and um, I'm just set, this is all just setting up um, data with multiple changes. So I've got town here. This is my change points. So depending on how long I set my data, so I've got it here as a thousand. You can change that to see the the effect of the lengths of the different segments if you want. Um, and then I'm taking it, um, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.13, etc. Through the data. Um, and then H here is going to be my kind of parameter that's changing. Uh, as you see here, I've got H times J going on. So this is my kind of non-parametric parameter. So I'm not going to estimate this parameter at all. And um, I'm just using this to control that I am actually changing my distrib empirical distribution function at these time points within the data. Okay. So all I'm doing then is, is I'm just saying for every data point um, here between one and N, I'm going to create some data that is um, a sum here. So I'm not going to be within my normal distribution kind of framework here. Um, well, I am in the sense that I've got normal errors, but I'm I'm not actually, you know, if I wanted to do cpt.mean, this isn't a mean change that we're looking here. This is a distributional change, okay? Uh, and j my function j is just this function here, which is just one times, well, one plus sine x over two. Okay, so that's just giving me um, uh, uh, what my distribution is, is going to be. Okay, so it looks a little bit complicated, but all I'm doing is I'm setting up um, my um, parameters that I'm looking at so that I can create something that's from several different distributions. But instead of just concatenating that, I'm, I'm calculating it on a per data point basis using a for loop here. Okay, so then I'm going to use cpt.np. Just like we have done before, I'm going to put in my data, um, I'm going to use pout here. Um, and then I'm going to do a minimum segment length of two. And my number of quantiles here is, is this is our, um, um, this is kind of what's suggested within the paper as, as a good value for, for the length, um, based on the length of the data. And if I look at my change points here, I've got them at 0 0.1, 0 0.13, 0 0.15, 2.3, .3, which is kind of what I was estimating here. 0 0.1, 0 0.13, 0.15, 0.23, sometimes in that by a thousand. Okay, so they're, they're all kind of coming through. And if we take a look at this data, so this is this is the actual data with the change point locations on. So all of these look fairly obvious change points. And um, if you were to fit a normal distribution to this, um, then it, it would potentially fit more change points because it's, it's not normally distributed. You kind of see you've got a little run here at the beginning um, that may get spotted as a as a change in, in variance if you're doing the CPT mean var, for example. Um, so that's just kind of an example of a, a, a non-parametric data set that, that we can look at. So now I'm going to ask you to look at some heart rate data. So if you load the changepoint.np package um, and look at the heart rate data, so you can just do data heart rate here. And uh, we're going to look at that and then use the cpt.np function um, to see if there's any, any evidence for changes in the heart rate. Oh, sorry, that was my solution. Um, so yeah, so take a look uh, again. Um, I'll kind of give you, um, well, we've, we've not long since had a break. So I think I'll, I'll just give you five minutes for this one. So uh, we'll come back at 11.35.
let's come back together. And what did people find with this one? How many change points were there? 33. Okay, let's take a look. So I got 33. I used the four log, um, log length, uh, log n, um, as the number of quantiles. If you change the number of quantiles, then you will get um, slightly different numbers of change points. Um, but not by too much within within this data set. Um, so again, I used um, Methodist PELT for this one. Uh, if you use different ones, you may also find different numbers of change points. Um, and then I just did the number of change points there. So let's take a look. Um, so you can clearly see within this data set that you've got something going on. So this is heart rate. So uh, this was when one of our PhD students went on a run. And um, so you can kind of see from the beginning their heart rate is quite low, and then it's increasing as they kind of start on their run. Um, so you may anticipate that, you know, depending on what type of assumption, modeling assumptions you might want to make, you might want to be able to fit a trend to this um, type of data uh, at the beginning. But then as, as you're kind of going along, there's not really much evidence for, for trends within some of the other parts. And um, this big dip kind of just after 600, and um, that was a stop at some traffic lights. Um, so that was kind of when the heart rate kind of drops down because um, she stopped running because uh, she had to wait for the traffic lights. But then across other different sections, um, you can kind of see that um, it's maybe, you know, not clear what is driving the change in, in some aspects, but then in others, it's a little bit clearer as to, as to why the change points might have occurred. Remembering that we're not looking at changes in mean here or variance, we're looking at changes in the distribution of um, the data here. Okay. Right. So if we use crops here for this one, so again, we can do penalty equals crops um, with the PELT method. I'm looking between five and 200 here. Um, there's potentially 91 different um, runs that it has to do. It um, only had to do 84 at that point. And if we're kind of looking here, um, you can see the diagnostic here is less peaked than it is um, in the um, previous setting. So what we're really looking for here is this is kind of akin to a scree plot if, if you're used to looking at principal component analysis. Um, essentially, we're looking for the elbow here. And in some plots and some real data, the elbow is really obvious. You've kind of got something like this going on where you can go, oh, yep, this is this is our elbow. But like in this example here, it's less obvious exactly where that elbow is. It's clear that we don't want a solution over here where you've got kind of between 60 and 80 data points. And it's clear that we don't just want a single data, a single change point because that's kind of right at the top here. But where we kind of draw the line across this curve is very subjective. OK, and so there is quite a large dip there between and um, around kind of the 75 mark down to around 50. So there's a large dip there that, that might trigger us to say, OK, well, that's a large decrease. So I definitely want to include that. But after that, there's some smaller decreases. So maybe I don't. But then there's another potentially interpretable as, as large um, decrease kind of around the 45 down to around 40 mark. Uh, marked by these two vertical red lines. Um, so they may be two things that we might want to be looking at here. So these are at 11 change points and 15 change points here. So our 33 that we got is kind of uh, across this part. And I would potentially argue that the 33 under the default was potentially too many change points for this, for this data set because we're kind of quite a way down that kind of curve aspect. And if I was in my head kind of wanting to fit almost two straight lines to that data point, I, I would probably be converging around this, uh, the 20 mark. And then I'm looking there, is there any evidence that I should shift one way or the other, by evidence meaning large kind of shifts at that point. So let's look at these two um, with 11 and 15 change points. So this is 11 change points within my data. Remember, we're not looking at a change in mean or change in variance, we're looking at change in distribution here. So whereby you might think, oh, there's something going on just after 400 at this point um, where there seems to be some dynamics there. Actually, if you look at the distribution of that whole segment, it's, it's um, more consistent than, than you might be expecting. Okay. So then this is 11 change points and then this is 15. So you can see that 
Some of them move slightly. So if, if you if you, I'll flick between, uh, if you look at this one here between 200 and 400, kind of just over 300, you'll see, uh, you'll see that it moves slightly to the left and right as, as I'm adding stuff in. Same with this one before 200. Um, you'll see that moves slightly as well when we add more change points in. So just remembering that Pell is not um, a conditional you know, observation, uh, sorry, conditional um, algorithm on the previous change points like binary segmentation is, it will move change points um, as you go from one um, number of one solution to, to the next. So 11 and 15, you know, you might think, oh yeah, I can kind of see that there might be some benefits of choosing one over the other, but depending on what you're actually wanting to use this for afterwards, um, whether the inference is on the change point locations themselves, or you just need it to kind of correct so that they're all from a single distribution, might affect whether you are um, conservative or, or not in the estimation of the number of change points. It depends what you want to do with it afterwards. So I'm gonna kind of flick to looking at some of our checking assumptions here. So let's think our head back to um, some of the earlier distributions that we were looking at. So if we look at the normal likelihood test that we were looking at, what are we actually, what assumptions are we actually making? So we're assuming that they're normally distributed, both the pre and post change point data, but um, we're assuming they're independent because we are just adding up the um, likelihoods both from the left and the right, and we're also adding up in between the, um, when we're looking at the test statistic for a particular segment, we're assuming independence within that segment as well, okay? And for if we're looking at the cpt.mean function, we're assuming that a variance is constant across the data. So the question is, how can we actually check these? And for a change point analysis, it's, it's a little bit like a chicken and egg situation because you need to kind of make an assumption to do a change point analysis. You can't check these assumptions prior to a change point analysis because if you look at, say, independence, if I do, if I have a change in mean and I do an autocorrelation plot, for example, and look at what the autocorrelation is, and um, so just using the ACF function inside R, then I'm going to find high autocorrelation in my data at large lags because the mean changes induce false autocorrelation in my data. So even if I, you know, you can try this yourself, even, even if I simulate just changing mean normal distribution, like some of the very early ones that we were using, if I do that and just do ACF on it, you know it's independent data because that's what you've simulated, but you're going to get very, very high autocorrelation coming through. So I can't check things like independence. I can't check normally, normally distributed data prior to knowing where the change points are because I would have a mixture of two normal distributions, so it wouldn't be normal, okay? If, it, if I just did the, for example, the um, histogram of the whole data, it would look like a mixture of normal distributions because that's what it is, and it won't pass a test of normality. Uh, again, I've already said um, the variance across the data, I can't check that prior to knowing where the change point locations are either because the estimate of the variance needs the mean, okay? So how can we check these? What we have to do is we have to check them after the analysis. So I'm just going to show you just in a couple of observations here. So we've got a mean distribution here. If I look at the histogram of this, this is what it comes out with. I have a mixture of two normal distributions. If I tested for normality there, that would not be um, appropriate because it, it would clearly say it's not a normal distribution because it isn't, it's a mixture, okay? And doing that, if I do the um, shapiro wilkes test here of normality, or the kamal smirnoff test here for normality, then you'll see it is definitely not normally distributed if I just look at the whole data, okay? Similarly, if I look at the autocorrelation function, as I said, we've generated it from a normal distribution with no autocorrelation whatsoever. And yet, here is high autocorrelation at large lags inside my autocorrelation function plot. And this is because of the change in mean that, we're, that we have within the data. So I would say here, you know, you might be verging on calling this long memory, okay? Because you, especially if I plot it for higher lags and, you, and you'll see the pattern continues. So how do we do that? So what we have to do is we have to check the residuals. So we have to fit a model 
making assumptions that we believe could potentially be plausible and then check the residuals, okay? So what I can do here is, so if I go back to our very first example, the m1.amoc, and I look at the parameter estimates for that. So I'm taking, I'm doing dollar mean here so that I just get the mean, just so it's a bit more general for you guys. Uh, and that'll give me the means, okay? If I want to get the residuals, then I do my original data, which is M1, minus, um, I'm using the, the um, rep function for, to get repeated here. So I need to repeat my means because these are just the means of each individual segment. So for each mean, I need to repeat it the number of um, data points that are in my segments. So seg.len will give me the length of each segment. So the length of the data between two change points. Okay. It's a handy little function for, for doing stuff like this. So I will have my um, first mean will be repeated the number of observations that are in the first set. If I'm remembering back, it's 100. And then my second mean um, in this scenario will also be repeated second number of observations. So this will give me a vector that gives me the mean at every single location that I've estimated, okay? So I'm then taking that away from the original data. And then if I do my test for normality, then um, I, do not, um, I do not reject the hypothesis, uh, the null hypothesis that it is normally distributed. Okay, so the null hypothesis here is that it is normally distributed and my p-value here is not small enough that I would reject that um, assertion. Okay, if I do the ks.test, I do the same. Um, I'm um, saying that the mean is, is the mean of the residuals and the standard deviations and the standard deviation of the residuals. And again, uh, it's exactly the same thing. I say these, um, the residuals and the normal probability, um, I'm saying my null hypothesis is that they are equivalent um, or the same, and I do not reject that null hypothesis either, okay? And if I look at uh, my QQ plot of my residuals, so that's what I've got here, uh, QQ norm, uh, normal QQ plot here, um, they're not too far away from the line, and um, you've got a little bit jutting off here, but for the size of the data that I'm looking at, that's not too extreme. So, those um, normality tests coupled with my QQ plot, I would kind of say, okay, I'm happy that my residuals are normally distributed. I then look at my autocorrelation function of my residuals. Now look at this, just taking away that mean, all that autocorrelation has disappeared. And I'm just getting here that I have a, a very, um, um, this is uh, lag zero. So this is just uh, one and then all of my other other um, lags are within the bounds of um, zero um, as, a, as an estimate, okay? So I said that that is not um, correlated whatsoever. So my test now is I want to have you go back and just look at any of the um, assumptions that we've made previously on any of the data sets um, that, that we've kind of looked at. Use, use what we've done here. Um, oh, uh, use what we've done here to kind of, this is for a mean check. If you obviously want to scale the variances, then, then you'll have to um, create a vector as, as we do here, create a vector of the variances, but then divide by that, uh, in, uh, divide the data by um, that instead of taking it away. So we take away a mean here and you divide by um, the variance to rescale it to be variance one. So I'm going to invite you now, um, I'm going to give you 15 minutes for this because um, we're kind of, um, looking um, a bit longer here. I'm going to say, go back, check any of the data sets that you want to that we've kind of looked at and think about, well, are the assumptions valid that we've kind of looked at? And what effect might, you know, if you find they're not valid, try and think about what effect that that invalidity um, may have on any of the inference that you might have made. Um, we'll kind of go from there. So I'll give you until five past 12. Um, and then we can kind of come back together uh, for the final few slides. So I should have said again, if you're having any issues, um, do pop it into the chat.
Okay, let's come back together. How did people get on? Um, I checked the GP data. What did you find? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think I did one test and I did, I don't know if I've done this wrong, but I got it not normally distributed. But then when I did the, the KS test, it seemed to be different to the Shapiro test. So I was a bit confused then because they're, they're different p-values. Exactly. And, and this is one of the things that they're, they're both testing different things. So the Shapiro test is designed for a test for normality, whereas the KS test is designed to test any two sets of data and say, do they have the same distribution or not? So they're different tests and they're doing different things. Um, and sometimes they do come up with different answers like that as well. Um, and also, when you look at that GP data, you can see those kind of two observations that were kind of both negatively and positively more unusual from the other data points. And so those can throw off a test of normality, especially in small amounts of data. Right. Um, like, like, I think there was just over 50 observations for that one. Um, so yeah, good, good. I'm glad, I'm glad, to, glad you managed to get something. It's not, it's not always clear cut though. No, so even I, you check these assumptions. Spend ages looking at p-values, wondering what does it mean sometimes? Because sometimes it means one thing in a different test and other times you want it to be below. Yeah, yeah. So so the idea there is, is the null hypothesis is that they're the same or, or that they're normally distributed. So you want a p-value higher than uh, 0.05 in, if you're using a 95% test for, for that one. Um, I, I also do exactly the same. Like, Wait a minute, do I want this smaller or larger? Yeah. I can't remember. <laughs> so I do have to check myself on, on that as well. So that's good. Um, somebody else trying to do the um, HC1 data. And they found that they, when they were doing the Shapiro test, that it came up with an error because it said the sample size must be between three and 5,000. Uh, 5,000? Yeah, 5,000. So that's an interesting one as well. Of, well, the Shapiro test clearly, um, as implemented in R, can't handle large amounts of data like that. So, so that's um, there. You could chunk it up into smaller bits and test the smaller bits if you wanted to, um, or you could use something else um, as, as, as another option there. Um, in general, I'm, I'm a fan of just using the um, QQ plots and just having a look, being mindful and having experience with lots of different types of data. Um, if you're not sure, one of the easy things to do as well is just to simulate some data from the model that you fit. So say we're doing a change in mean and variance model, simulate some data from that mean and variance model. Does it look anything like your data? Um, and that can sometimes be helpful to kind of check some, some of the other things like whether that autocorrelation does matter and things like that. Um, autocorrelation is a, a big one for, for, for just simulating from the model and checking if it looks like your data. Um, so that's good. Okay. Sorry, but you know with yeah. the, the HC1 data, there's too many points. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sure this is statistically bad, so I'm not really sure. But um, I know there's some functions now where you can like take random samples from a, a set of data. Yeah. Would that be bad statistically, or is that a kind of valid thing to take out a, a random sample that makes it less than the three thousand or whatever, and then do the test? Yeah, you, you can certainly do that, and if you do that several times, and then you yeah. can have a look at the distribution of the p-values for those different times as well. Um, that's often something that people do for. I mean, the assumption is that you've taken away all of the mean changes and the variance changes so they should all be from the same distribution right. so from kind of again these are all assumptions that we're making but using that assumption that um that kind of null hypothesis that the data should be from um whatever distribution that you've um got got as your error distribution whether it's normal or exponential etc once you've kind of taken away those changes and you're looking at the residuals your assumption is that they, they are um, all from the same distribution. And so if they are, then yes, you can just do that and take random samples and that is statistically valid. If you get very, very different p-values across those different samples that you might take, bearing in mind that you need to take a large enough sample to um, kind of, I mean, if you're taking samples of 5,000, for example, that would be more than enough. That's like the, the largest that the Shapiro one, uh, can take. Um, then, if you're taking those random samples, provided the number, the amount you're taking within each sample is large enough um, to kind of 
invoke the the central limit theorem and all of those sorts of um, conditions that come with it, then that that will mean that you should be getting very similar values for 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 the um, I should say you shouldn't be getting similar values for the um, p value because under the null, if the null is correct, the p values are actually um, uniform distributed. So don't be thinking that you should be getting the values very, very similar. That's also very confusing from, from yeah. that setting. <laughs> but, but the point is you shouldn't be getting lots of them that are coming out as um, significant to reject the null. Yeah, That's got you. Point. Okay. That's confusing, but I get that, I think. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, yeah. Great. Okay, so, so let's kind of just um, look at these. So I do have a consolidation task that I'm, I'm not going to ask you to do right now. It's more of a fun task looking at um, different TV shows. Um, but what I kind of and looking, can you predict when they've been cancelled or not based on, on um, viewer ratings? Um, it's quite interesting as if, if you're interested in kind of just looking from a more purely you know, non-work perspective at how change points might be um, able to be used for, in this type of context. Um, uh, oh yeah, that's that's for the, can those be predicted? What I do want to do instead of that is I just want to kind of give you a practical example of how we've used this um, with some NHS data. Um, and I can do this this year because the paper has been published. Um, so there's a paper that we've got in HPB, uh, it's on my website if you, if you want to look at the paper. And it's looking at um, these uh, data that we've got here. So this is, um, can you guys all see my R, R studio? Yep, we're good. Um, so this is um, GP, uh, sorry, not GP, a and &E visits, counts of a, um, sorry, not counts, proportion of a and &E visits that are due to um, gastro. Um, um, uh, as, as they enter, they present with a gastro um, typing. Um, and what we can see here is that the proportion of these visits due to gastro is increasing over time, um, potentially with some other behavior going on like change points, for example. Now within this type of data, um, when we're looking at this over quite a long time period, um, here we're looking from 2010 up until 2020, that's what my axis is on the, on the bottom. Um, and when we're looking within this type of data, often things change such as um, the typings that within the A&E, they, they may change what they're defining as gastro over time. You know, new, uh, new categories come in that might be defined as gastro that maybe otherwise previously wouldn't be. So you might expect some changes due to some of those um, administrative changes that have taken place. Sometimes you know when they are, sometimes you don't. Uh, if you know when they are, great. You can kind of just um, do that and correct for it. You don't need change point analysis for that. But if you don't know when they are and you think there's something going on with the data, then you might need to do something. So what we're wanting to do here is we're wanting to forecast um, the um, proportion of cases going forwards uh, for the next year to kind of help with um, um, looking at what the load might be within, within this department and um, within this hospital. So the, the problem with these change points is they interfere with our goal of forecasting. So what we could do is we can say, okay, well, around 20, just before 2018, there seems to have been something going on where we've had a big drop in the proportion, et cetera. Um, and I should say, if, if you kind of look at the overall GP cases, um, sorry, not GP, um, A&E admissions, then it follows um, a similar pattern. Um, so when you're looking at this proportion here, you, you don't really want to be, you can't forecast the whole lot. So you might want to say, okay, well, I kind of think it looks pretty stable from 2018 onwards. Maybe I'll just use the last couple of years of forecasting. But that kind of ignores the fact that actually we have all of this data previously that might be able to help us explain those dynamics a bit more, especially if I'm wanting seasonal factors. If I'm estimating seasonal factors just off two years of data, it's not very good. So let's see if we can use change point analysis to help us here. So um, this is all freely available data, and um, this is just the reproducibility script from the paper. So it's it's again freely available with the paper. And um, so I'm going to show you how to use MCPT with this, because um, we haven't kind of I've talked about it, but I haven't kind of looked at that before. So I know for this data because I'm, I'm looking at it. There's a trend within the data. 
So my final model is this trend CPT model. Let me just show you what happens um, without before we get to that point. Okay. So if I do, um, ours is going to be equal to MCPT of um, the data that I have here. So I've got, um, um, this is going to be my um, GP, uh, um, GS percentage here that I'm looking at. Um, I'm just going to do MCPT of that. That's going to fit 12 different models to that data. If I was looking at this across many different um, pr presentations, maybe I'm not just looking at gastro, I'm looking at a bunch of other things, or maybe I'm looking at across a bunch of different hospitals, depending on what level um, within the NHS you are, you might not want to be able to look at every single one and try and decide this. So um, if I look at the first element of this list here, uh, what it gives me is the output of all of these 12 different models. So it tells me what the likelihood is for each one of them and what the number of parameters is for each one of them. Um, and I can use that to automatically, um, for example, I can also do um, BIC of out here and that'll give me the BIC value. So I could I could do this minimally, you know, if I look at which, which one is the minimum here, that's 378. Um, and I can look at which.min to get me that that is the trend one. So if I look at the BIC, then the trend CPT is the minimum, and I can write a script that will automatically kind of pick this out for each of the data sets and, and, and look at, you know, look at that fit for each one. But for, for um, MCPT, we've got, um, so I can do a plot here and I can do uh, type equals BIC, and that will give me a, a, BI, a plot of the BIC values for all of the different data sets. So what it can tell me here is that the mean is really I shouldn't just be using a flat mean for this data. I shouldn't even really be using a flat trend for this data because that's quite low as well. But then we've got lots of different models here that, that are kind of around the similar ones. All the, all the change point ones that have a star next to them mean that they actually fit no change points. Okay. So if I did a, a mean change point plus AR1, I would just get an AR1. I, there's no change points that are fitted to that. Um, but the trend change points coming out the best, close um, kind of second is this trend change point with AR1. But there's not quite enough evidence for that AR1 term to come through. Um, so then I can also just do the um, plot of that fit. Um, so looking for trend change point there. So I'm just doing plot. I have to use the dollars there to get which model I'm wanting to fit, um, but it's all named. So then this is the plot here. And this is just a normal change point object because this is a, a change point um, one. So I can um, do exactly the same. I, uh, I can do CPT up width is three and then that'll make it um, brighter for you. So that hopefully you can see it a bit better. So you can see we've got two change points within this data. Okay, so if I wanted to then do the forecast, what I can do is the last trend line is the one that I'm interested in because that's my current trend line. So rather than getting rid of the whole, you know, getting the residuals, I can instead get, in, get rid of the effect of these two different trend lines that, that might be different from this middle part here. And um, so that I put it on all on the trend line of the last one. So that's essentially what, what I kind of do across this bit, um, oh, that's splitting into modern data and testing. So here I'm just um, getting the residuals. So this, this is the full residuals. And then basically I, I correct it afterwards um, so that I'm putting back on that final um, model here. And this is then the data set that I get that I can then do my forecast with. And that's cleaned of the change points and just kind of looking at that going forwards. So that's kind of something that you guys can do um, if change points are a bit of a nuisance um, in the data. And with a lot of COVID and everything else, um, change points are a bit of a nuisance at the moment. Um, so that's just kind of a practical way that, that you can actually use some of the stuff that I've kind of talked to you about today. Um, MCPT is helpful because it can kind of do a lot of those modeling automatically for you. And then you can just correct um, for the effects that that you might be seeing for different things. And you may want to correct down to a baseline level, or as in this example, I wanted to do some forecasting. So I corrected to the final level so that my forecast would be kind of good going forwards. And this now means that I, I can use the whole of the 10 years worth of data to be able to do my forecasting instead of just the final two. And that kind of helps um, with not only the errors going for, well, not only with the estimation and the errors going forwards uh, as we're kind of looking forward. So I just thought that might be a, a practical example to kind of show you guys before I kind of talk about um, just the, the last section. So 
I've put some references there and there's also um, more references on my website. I'm really, really happy to have contact from people um, if you guys are wanting to try this out for, for some data that you have. And if you're coming across any problems, please do reach out to me because um, I do you know, want to help people trying to use the package and, and things like that. Um, so do reach out for any problems that you've got. And um, that one that I kind of presented just there um, was coming out from a conversation that I had with, with, a, um, with a consultant at, um, um, I think it was at Bolton uh, uh, Hospital at the time. So do reach out. Um, I'm very interested in all of these applications across the NHS for many, many different um, reasons, whether it's because you're interested in the change point or you want to correct for them. Um, I'm kind of agnostic to that. I, I just um, want to help you guys be able to actually analyze the, the data that you have to. Um, so. I, We've kind of got nine minutes um, if anybody wants to ask any questions um, before we finish off. Um, uh, Emma, do you want to stop the recording just so that people can feel Yeah, free? I was just going to say I'll stop the recording now.